Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Westfall, Vice President of Henry Schein Financial Services. I'm joined today by Jeff Agronoff, Consulting Principal, and Lou Pizzoleo, Partner of Grassi Advisors, who will lead our discussion on the recent changes to the Paycheck Protection Program. We will have a live Q&A session at the conclusion of this webinar. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Henry Schein has been a trusted source of valuable information for our customers. We've provided real-time updates on the CARES Act stimulus package and funding availability through the Small Business Administration. The Paycheck Protection Program saw unprecedented demand by small businesses impacted by COVID-19, primarily because up to 100% of the principal amount may be forgiven provided the loan proceeds are used on qualifying expenses. On June 5, 2020, the PPP Flexibility Act of 2020 was signed into law, which resulted in very favorable changes to this program. I will now turn it over to Jeff and Lou to review these changes in greater detail with you. Good afternoon, Jeff. Okay. Good afternoon, Lou. Good, good afternoon, Natalie. We thank you so much for inviting us back again, and we enjoyed speaking to everyone back a few weeks ago on uh, what was occurring in the PPP loan program, and, and a lot has changed. And uh, my partner, Lou, and I will go through some of the updates, particularly with the PPP Flexibility Act, which was just officially signed by the president at the end of last week. So there are some changes and nuances. Again, most of those changes are very positive, and we'll go through some of them now. And then Lou and I want to leave a, a good amount of time for question and answers. Um, we've uh, done a lot of other series with different business owners, especially over the last few days after the Flexibility Act, and we know there's still a lot of confusion, questions, strategies that need to be discussed, and uh, we'd be happy uh, to understand everyone's needs and be able to assist them in this process. So I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Lou, and he's going to go through uh, some of the updates that came through the Flexibility Act, outline them, and then, again, we'll have that discussion. Lou? Sure. Thank, thanks, Jeff, and uh, it's good to be here today. Uh, We've been following uh, the PPP program, it seems now, for uh, you know six months or half a century, um, although it's only been, I think, since uh, mid-March or so when the bill, the CARES Act, was initially drafted. Um, the recent uh, changes to the program uh, via the Flexibility Act have been talked about for two weeks or so, uh, and they really address some of the common challenges that business owners were facing with the CARES Act and PPP, the way it was drafted. Now, when they drafted the CARES Act back in, I guess, uh, mid, late March or early March, I don't think any legislator could have uh, envisioned uh, how long uh, and drawn out this would be. Uh, we're in June now, and I think uh, most places around the country are starting to reopen. I guess New York's probably the hardest hit, or well, one of the hardest hits, um, but there's uh, many businesses that haven't been able to open. So the Flex Act uh, changed a bunch of things that were a challenge in that regard um, with respect to the covered period. So the period in which expenses uh, that were used could be claimed for forgiveness in order to make this loan a grant, which was actually the intention. So they changed the eight week period to a 24 week period. Um, so your payroll costs for two and a half months, that's how the loans were sized. Um, now you have 24 weeks to spend that uh, loan amount and achieve forgiveness. Uh, there was another challenge with something in the regulation It actually wasn't in the original act, uh, I've referred to it as a collar. So there was this 7525 collar that said in order to get forgiveness on non payroll expenses, you needed to spend 75 cents on payroll expenses, payroll costs to achieve the other 25 cents on non payroll costs. Well, in some high rent areas uh, and certain businesses, that was particularly difficult. Uh, and they've changed that to 60 40 which is helpful. Um, the way the Flexibility Act was written, uh, it also changed it in an unintentional way, but they've addressed it. So the 60-40 in the actual legislation was written as a cliff. So if you didn't achieve 60% of spend on payroll costs, you wouldn't get any forgiveness. Um, the Treasury issued a press release yesterday that addressed that as we thought they would. 
um, and partial forgiveness will be permitted just as it was in the 75-25 scenario. Uh, one of the other um, significant changes was the June 30 magic date. So in order to take advantage of the grant section of the loan, you needed to um, maintain your FTEs and not reduce employer payrolls. However, there was a safe harbor if you brought people back by June 30th um, or you got payback to 100% by June 30th, then you would have safe harbor and you wouldn't get penalized for loan forgiveness. The June 30th date has changed. It's now December 31st. Uh, again, you know, in, in, in the state that we're in, uh, we're hopeful that by December 31st, for most businesses, things will be somewhat normalized. June 30th was sort of premature in, in that regard. A couple other changes that we think are minor but helpful. Um, so for pieces of the loan that uh, are not forgiven, um, payments would have started six months after the forgiveness date. They extended that to 10 months after the covered period ends. Um, they also um, um, sorry, they, they also extended the term out from a two-year term to a five-year term. So whatever isn't forgiven is due back um, in, for loans that predated um, the, the Flex Act two years but it did allow the bankers the option to uh, extend that term out to five years and any new loans after the Flex Act will have a five year term. The one piece that is left unclear, which we're hoping for some clarification in the next week, we know that the um, Treasury has a suite of about 30 additions to its FAQ document and they're drafted but holding them. We're expecting them to come out this week or or the following week. Um, one of the items that um, wasn't addressed specifically is the $100,000 cap. So in the old um, CARES Act and PPP, you had uh, forgiveness for individual payroll um, limited to 100K cap or 850 seconds of that $100,000 cap, which would be $15,384, $15,384. So no one employee could contribute more to your loan forgiveness than that $15,384. And that was based on an eight-week period and a $100,000 cap. What's unclear is whether that $100,000 cap now becomes 2450 seconds, which would be 46000 or it stays at the 15000 We believe, based on logic uh, and the way the CARES Act is written, that it will be the 24 50 seconds, um, but the regulations haven't been introduced to clarify that. So that's how that's that's the um, that's all I have from a bullet point standpoint on on the Flex Act. It wasn't a very long act. Uh, it was written as a revision to the CARES Act, so it was um, 10 pages or so, uh, and probably four or five pages of of meat, and then a lot of filler. Um, so those are the those are the key things that it had changed. We believe it's a uh, significant relief. Um, it did, there was a lot of dialogue that the program will end, so you can't apply after June 30th. Um, the Republicans were particularly uh, adamant about uh, establishing that stake in the ground. However, since the Flex Act was signed into law on Friday and today, which I guess it's Tuesday, um, there's some dialogue that they may extend the application window further than June 30th. There's still about 130 billion left in the program, um, and there's still banks writing PPP loans. So there's some uh, dialogue that the program may be extended past June 30th. Okay, and Lou, just to add to some of what you shared, we know we've spoken to a lot of people in the Henry Schein network. Uh, that have applied, but a lot that haven't applied and might be nervous to apply. Um, a lot of the reasons that people were concerned have now gone away, as Lou has shared. So some of what we would like to go over today is if you haven't applied, what are the steps to apply? What are the risks that you might have? Which, again, like anything else, there's some risk, but not significant. Um, there's a lot more flexibility, hence why they you know, uh, called it the Flexibility Act. And um, if you're a business owner, and you've 
had any type of hit financially or operationally inside you know your organization, you really should have no issue with being eligible. One of the questions so Natalie, that I do you have want to go is, over some Q&A? Yeah, yeah, so um, we're just waiting for, you know, anyone that is listening, please feel free to type your questions into the chat function and we will address them live on the webinar. One of the questions that I have, um, Lou, you touched on it really briefly, is people that already applied for or received PPP funds. Um, many of these companies or small businesses were really managing to that eight-week time frame. How does this really change uh, for them? Sure, we, we've seen this come up a lot and it, it is a challenge from a business perspective. Uh, I, I've had several folks that I've been helping along with this that were managing to that eight week deadline. So if they had, let's say, you know, seven or eight or 15 full-time equivalents in their baseline period, they may have brought somebody back earlier than they really needed to, um, to take advantage of the eight week period. Uh, they did allow the borrower to elect to use the eight-week period, so I, I don't know that there's much advantage there other than to just kind of leave it behind you. Uh, so if you achieve all the spend and you maintain your FTEs and you still want to apply for forgiveness after your eight-week period, um, you're still allowed to do so. You can elect to do that. Um, I know for the majority of folks that I'm working with, and there's quite a few, maybe one or two are at that point. The other challenge will be in the, the reality of that is the banks aren't quite set up yet to start processing loan forgiveness. So you may get to a point where your eight week period is over, but your bank isn't ready to uh, process your forgiveness application anyway. So it's, it is a bit of a challenge. Um, the good news is, you know, I think in the early parts of PPP, the goalposts seem to be moving further and further out for folks to achieve forgiveness. Uh, the past three or four changes, um, starting with how they changed the certification uh, guidance, and then with the initial forgiveness application, and now with the Flex Act, have all moved the goalposts in. So it's more likely the large majority of folks that applied for a PPP loan will use it as a grant rather than a loan and that really was the legislative intent even though they used the 7a loan program to get the money out the objective was to have a grant for the sustainability of jobs not just in that eight-week period but long-term sustainability because um you know if they provide a grant it kicks the can down the road eight weeks that doesn't help anybody the objective here was to help these businesses survive through this troubled time uh, and have working capital for when the lights come back on. So I, I think the 24 weeks definitely achieves that. Um, the December 31st date is, is you know, uh, like I said, in, when they wrote this in March, who would have thought we'd be talking in June and there's still businesses that aren't open. Um, right. So I think they've achieved all that. But yes, there, there were many, many folks that were managing to that eight week timeline uh, and now have a different timeline to manage to. Yeah, and Lou, just to add yeah. to that point too, if if you've managed the eight week point and you think you've had most, if not all, the money spent, granted the banks might not be completely ready. The idea also is you would work on the June thirtieth headcount requirement, or obviously the average of the eight weeks, where for some reason you felt your business was going to have a, a greater effect later in the year, you might choose to go with that eight week period. That's the most common reason I'm seeing some people and clients kind of go that route. But I agree, the vast majority are likely going to go for the 24 weeks to just make sure you're getting you're using all of the dollars in the part you know that were allocated to you i think even from a simplicity stake standpoint you know if you if you use a 24-week period most companies will be able to capture it just with payroll costs yeah. uh, and there won't be a need to kind of look at rent and other costs and utilities which you know it's much easier to capture your payroll and payroll registers and 941s than it is all the other documentation required around all the non-payroll costs. So if just for sake of simplicity, it'll, it'll be a win. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Could you touch on um, the calculation of FTEs? Because I know there's been some, um, some questions about that as well that added some confusion. Sure, so um, unfortunately the CARES Act never defined it. Uh, so early in the... Uh, in the process, we were using uh, analogy to, um, I forgot which act, but it was an older. The ACA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was a different act, and that the 
threshold there was 30 hours. Yeah. Uh, we had talked about a 30 hour threshold as many other people did. Um, and when they put out the, I think it was in the forgiveness application, they defined it as 40 hours. And, and there's two methods by which you can do it. You can do uh, a calculation. If somebody worked 30 hours, um, then they're a percentage of FTE, they're three quarters of an FTE. Um, or you can take a simplified method and anybody who's under 40 is half of an FTE. Uh, and those that are over 40 are one FTE. So one employee can't be more than one FTE. So you basically take all your full-timers out, and those are your FTEs, and then you accumulate all your part-timers uh, and accumulate the hours worked in the period, divide by 40, and that'll get you to your FTEs. So the calculation is important um, because that's the sort of fraction of what will be forgiven in your spend during your covered period. So you have to look at your baseline period and the um, act gave you a choice of two baseline periods to measure this from, either 215, 2020 through 630, 2020. So you look at that period, you take all your payroll registers, you calculate your FTEs per payroll register, you add them all up, you divide by the number of payroll periods, and that gives you your average FTEs in the period. And then you use that as your base to compare it against your eight week or now your 24 week period in the same fashion. Uh, if you if you choose, there's two baseline periods. You can use that 19 period, or you can use January and February of 2020. So if you were in a business that declined from that period, you're going to use the lower number. Um, same thing if you hired people between those dates, you're going to use the older, lower number. So go with the lower number. So let's say you had um, 10 employees in your baseline period, and <coughs> excuse me, during the 24 weeks. Uh, covered period, the 24 weeks after your loan funded. Um, let's say you had eight FTEs on average in that period. And, you know, whatever you spent will be forgiven only 80%. Unless you bring that people back by the magic date, which is now December 31st. So that's really the most um, piece okay. of this penalty. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing I was hoping you could touch on is if offices are not able to bring people back, um, you know, due to, you know, certain restrictions that are maybe been imposed based on um, HHS, CDC, or OSHA, um, you know, are those, you know, going to be given any special consideration for those certain areas? For sure. So the, the forgiveness guidelines, the application that came out before the Flex Act, created uh, four or five new safe harbors or clarified the safe harbors. So if somebody voluntarily leaves uh, during your covered period or they're terminated for cause or you've reduced them and offered them their job back and they don't come back, um, none of those are penalties for your FTE calc. You sort of exclude them from the top and the bottom of the fraction. Um, also, the Flex Act introduced an even broader safe harbor where if you were closed because of government mandate uh, and you couldn't bring the people back in your covered period, then you wouldn't get penalized. And it also had one that was even more broad in that if the business um, volume has changed as a result of COVID, you still have safe harbor. What's unclear is how they'll actually propose regulations to monitor that or how they'll um, process that in the forgiveness application. Um, but when we look at some other guidance of the past, usually they use metric. So, you know, if your revenue is down, let's say 25, 50% year over year in that period, that's probably a good guideline to claim that safe harbor. Um, we're not certain on how they'll regulate that, but there probably will be some kind of empirical evidence that you'll have to provide to claim that safe harbor. Thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the other things that I, I think is interesting is there was so much uh, focus and energy on the forgiveness application that was posted, um, and there was still a lot of, you know, unclarity. And you know, in, in my opinion, uh, we were waiting for some of those, um, you know, provisions to be finalized. Um, 
Do you see, do you have any type of timeline on when the new forgiveness application will be released? And if there are any, um, you know, guidance on, on when that process, you know, for the people that already got their loans, um, well, can they still start the process of using that old application or do they need to wait for, for new guidance there? So the, the Treasury spoke yesterday in a press release. They highlighted some of the critical points. Um, the big one being this cliff on the 60-40. They clarified that that won't be the case. Um, that was a concern for a lot of folks, as you might imagine. Um, they didn't give can you, clar can you just elaborate on that 60-40 uh, again? Sure. So there's, a, there's this, um, it wasn't in the original CARES Act, but the first early regulations created a scenario where in order to claim forgiveness for non-payroll costs, you had to have payroll dollars. So the way that it worked is if you spent 75% 75 cents on payroll costs, you can then claim another 25 cents on non-payroll costs. So all your allowable costs in the loan, both allowable and for forgiveness, had to follow that pattern. So you could spend more on payroll, but to the, expen to the extent you wanted to claim or use the loan proceeds for um, non-payroll costs, you had to have payroll costs. Um, there was never this cliff version of it. So let's say you had a million dollar loan and you spent six, 600,000 on payroll, you would still be able to achieve forgiveness. You didn't have to get to the full 75% of the loan amount. Um, however, when they lowered that collar to 60-40, the way they wrote the legislation in the Flex Act suggested that it would be a cliff. So in that same million dollar loan, if you didn't spend 600,000 on payroll, you wouldn't get any forgiveness. Um, Mark Rubio um, was the biggest sort of fighter for this provision and for it not to be a cliff. And he suggested that it would be dealt with in regulation, which is sometimes difficult when something's written into the law without changing the law. Um, but the Treasury confirmed yesterday in a press release that yes, in fact, it won't be a cliff. There'll still be partial forgiveness if you don't get to the 60% payroll and the loan size, you'll still get partial forgiveness. So that was um, that was a grave concern for a lot of folks. As far as timing for the new applications, I know that there's these FAQs that are out there. I know you know we've heard from the inside that they're drafted, they're ready to go. Um, I suspect they're all going to go out at once. If it's my luck, it'll be on a Friday night or a Sunday morning. That's typically how they've done these things to me in the past. Um, so I suspect it'll follow the same pattern, but they may come out this week. The new um, application, I think, is going to take significantly longer. Uh, I think they're going to be very careful about the way they introduce that. Just from a pattern, that, that was the way they handled the first one. They really took a lot of time. They kind of, the pattern has been that when they're not speaking for a while, it's because they're working on something big. So uh, the last time we heard them was, was on the forgiveness application then this press release. I suspect we won't hear from them probably for another week or so. Maybe we'll get these 30 FAQs and then another three days to a week before we get an application. It could be longer. Uh, the interesting thing that hasn't been addressed is if you, if you, let's say in week 10 or 11, you get everything spent and you have your FTEs, do you have to wait to week 24 to file for forgiveness? or can you file it along the way? I'm hopeful that they'll allow this sort of, you know, to just be kind of rolling when you achieve it, claim forgiveness. Uh, I think that'll help the banks. It won't be this sort of onslaught concentration all in one period. Um, I know it'll help our practice as well, so there's some selfishness as well. Um, no, let's all blow, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, we'll all deal with it, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll sort of, yeah, you know, it'll start at week eight and between weeks eight and week 24, everybody will get done as they achieve it. So. Okay. And the, banks, the banks also want these loans off their balance sheets too. So the sooner they're right, they get right. off their balance sheets. I was gonna ask if the interest rate was staying the same with the new terms. I didn't see anything it, to it, indicate it, otherwise, but. Yeah, no, it's staying the same at the 1%. And it, it's okay. interesting, it's lower than that at one point. It was also higher than that at one point. They lowered it, right? Lowered it to right. half a percent. But then the credit unions came forward and said, "Look, in our business model, on a half a percent, we're losing money." So they raised it to one percent. Okay. Okay. 
what else do you think that our customers, you know, considering that most of them or are self, you know, obviously self-employed dental and medical offices, um, what do you think that they need to know about, you know, the cha these changes? What else? I know you went through it really briefly, but is there anything that's really specific to our industry that you could cover? Yeah, I mean, I, I think on, you know, for sole proprietors and, and small businesses, the application process, um, depending on how they, you know, whether they're a, a flow through entity um, or whether it ends up um, where they run the business and it gets onto their tax return in a Schedule C. Um, those applications function slightly different than, let's say, the core. Um, and your tax accounting actually had a great impact on the way the loan would be sized and how it will be forgiven and how much sort of owner replacement income you could drive. Um, so I, I found in working, and we've worked with some folks in that structure, that was really the biggest limitation. So if they structured their um, sole proprietor income a certain way, they were very limited in how much loan size they could take. Um, even with some employees, um, you know, if you were a sole proprietor with a few employees and you really didn't take payroll yourself um, and you, you know, let's say managed your taxable income efficiently, you, uh, in that eight week period, you couldn't really allocate much income to yourself. You might be able to pay your employees, um, but it was difficult to have owner replacement income. So I think the smallest of the small really struggled quite a bit. You know, one of the other things that was in the application, which I don't believe they'll change, is for the sole proprietor, um, you know, there was a lot of talk, I think, or strategy talk around, well, you know, if I took a $25,000 or $50,000 payroll in 2019, during the eight-week period, I'm going to give myself a raise and maximize the forgiveness. Um, the application prevented you from doing that. It said for the owners and, and partners and the um the forgiveness app, you can't have compensation over your 2019 level. Uh, so they sort of addressed it that way. So yeah, I mean, I think there's some specific unique challenges for that group. And I know you serve customers, you know, from that size all the way up to, you know, multi-office, uh, large corp type dental practices. Yeah, Lou, I think the point that we're making here is obviously there's going to be more changes and nuances in the application. And we have to remember, whenever you're allowed to apply, you're only going to have really one bite at the apple. So you need to make sure the application is done and filled out correctly. Um, you don't want to misstate anything. You also don't want to understate. And you can't go back to the well again. So um, that's why, obviously, we've been helping a number of clients uh, and friends and people who have not been our clients until now. And, and obviously, you should select an appropriate advisor to help you through this process. No matter what your size is, you wanna make sure you maximize forgiveness. And with these ever-changing rules, and even banks will probably have some of their own particular rules and nuances as they did when you had the loan application. Not every bank had the same questions in their loan application process. We believe that will be the same in forgiveness, that there's gonna be some variances. We've even seen one of the banks of a client um, as for just already significant information that we do not believe is going to be required by the SBA, but that's what the bank has asked for um, in their forgiveness process. So it's going to change. It, it, there's going to be variances to it, and it's important you have somebody working with you to help understand it and to make sure that you're filling it out in the proper way. That's great advice, too. Um, I know you mentioned earlier, Jeff, that you've been talking to a lot of Henry Schein customers um, yes. since we did the webinar last month. What have been really some of the key questions from that group um, that's probably applicable to many on this webinar now? I, I, absolutely. Um, as you and Lou have shared before, I think you know we spoke to uh, various groups of sizes, but definitely a lot of uh, smaller practices who had anywhere from you know, three to five, three to six employees. Um, just, you know, back a few weeks to a concern about spending everything in eight weeks, which thankfully we don't have to worry about. Um, but to the earlier part, um, there were hazard pay was a very popular topic that came up, which maybe now becomes a little less vital. But if you have a practice and you decided to give people hazard pay, which we know and, you know, the dental profession, you know, if you, if you and your employees were working, they, you know, should potentially 
be able to earn some additional money. And you tried to do that to make sure you used all the money in eight weeks. Um, again, now that the Flexibility Act has passed, you can continue to do the eight weeks. I agree with Lou. Our only concern is if you're doing the eight week program to accelerate the forgiveness application, we wish we could sit here today and say, well, on July 1st, you can fill it out. Uh, the banks are surprisingly a little unprepared. Um, I, you know, Lou and I have been on the speaker circuit now for a couple of months, so I guess we're sort of PPP celebrities, but um, I can't tell you the amount of banks that are calling us and asking us questions, and we're very smart guys, but um, I would think they'd be a little more prepared. So um, one of the other things that's coming up, and we've had questions from Henry Schein clients even over the last 24 hours have been reaching out, is uh, there were some nuances in the Flexibility Act about um, the loan potentially, how it gets transferred 24 week period. If you had the loan established before the Flexibility Act passed, technically you're gonna have to uh, kind of bridge your loan or apply to use the 24 week period. And we had some very eager Beaver clients that were saying, well, they're calling up their banks. Oh, I, I just wanna make sure you're recording that I'm moving to 24 weeks. And the response of really all the banks so far is we don't even know how we're supposed to do it yet. So, you know, a few Henry Schein clients called us uh, over the last day or two saying, oh, what do I do? Am I doing the right thing? You are. Um, you know, again, that's why you know, we've been advising some of the Henry Schein clients and some have had other outside advisors. Talk to your advisors. Be proactive with the banks. Be proactive with your advisor and filling out the applica forgiveness application when the bank is ready to accept it. Uh, make sure, again, all the forgiveness application uh, work is reviewed. Um, that's been a lot of questions about, um, we just want to make sure the FTE, FTE count is right. We want to make sure uh, the expenses that we have of non-payroll cost are approved expenses. We're getting a lot of questions, Natalie, on, you know, what's a transportation cost? Uh, you know, what's rent? Can we pay back rent? Um, because, Lou, I know we've shared in, in other sessions uh, about the change they even made a week or two ago about you know incurred and paid now really changed to incurred or paid that's been another popular question as well um and again all these changes are positive they've truly made the program more accessible and more user friendly so we're pleasantly surprised by that but um again there are a lot of changes while they're good it has made the process unfortunately a little more complicated but we feel in 95, maybe even 98% of the cases, using a 24-week period, you should be able to get 100% forgiveness. Um, there are some people who potentially still want to keep part of this as a loan, and you're still going to be able to. But the ability to get the full loan turned into a grant is absolutely there for everyone. And we've been and very the, um, successful in working with people and showing them how to do that. The, the practice or, or best practice that we've seen folks taking, whether it's eight or 24 weeks, is model this out, forecast it out, the payroll, the non-payroll, um, think about when you're paying those items. Uh, you know, I, I know, especially the smaller um, practices, you know, they probably don't have a big finance group, um, but, you know, it's, it's important to have somebody sit down with a spreadsheet, model it out. Um, you would want to know in advance if you're not going to spend through it, um, you know, that'll, that'll allow you to sort of make adjustments or maybe take a business action that gets you to 100% forgiveness. So um, that's been our counsel is model it out or have somebody model it out. Um, whatever size, you know, if you have a sole proprietor accountant, they're capable of creating a financial model. Uh, if it's your mother-in-law or your wife who, who does it, they're capable of putting an Excel spreadsheet together. It doesn't have to be fancy, uh, you know, a raw cash flow forecast. And frankly, that's good practice with or without PPP to create a cash flow forecast that might help you kind of run the business going forward and um, tell you when you need to, you know, hunker down on receivables or when you need to delay payables. So it's, it's good pr business practice uh, with or without PPP. PPP just makes it a little bit more, uh, gives you another reason to do it. So it's um, one of the yeah, best practices. Yeah, for sure. It seemed with the first uh, tranche of funding that we went through it really quickly. And when the second round was added, we were all expecting um, that to go as quickly as well. And then it, it really stopped, you know, it didn't, you know, it didn't stop, but it slowed to a snail's pace um, compared to what it was initially. 
Um, do you think people were, you know, waiting this out? You know, do you have any comments about, you know, maybe why the activity changed so much? So I think there were there were two things, two drivers. Um, one was the fumble that the Treasury made with the certification. I think they scared everybody to think if they took the loan and somebody questioned it, they'd be locked up and be criminals. And yeah, no business owner wants to go to jail. It's not a good look. Um, or incur penalties while you're chasing a loan, you know, whether it was civil or whatever kind of penalties. So they took those teeth out. Um, you know, they created safe harbor for all loans under two million. They'll assume you made the certification in good faith. Um, they also said if it's over a two million dollar loan and they look at it and they determine for whatever reason they don't believe you made it in good faith, they'll ask for the money back. And as long as you give it back to them, they'll leave you alone. Um, so that helped, but I, I think that sort of theme turned off so many business owners and put a bad taste in, in folks' mouths that they shied away from it. Um, the other challenge was this eight week period. So, you know, many businesses that were closed said, I don't need a loan. This is, you know, I, I when eight weeks is up and I can open again, maybe, but right now I don't need a loan. I'm going to take this and it's going to be a loan. And many small business owners are afraid of debt. Um, so I can understand where that's come from. A lot of them operate very debt efficient. Um, so many didn't want to take on that debt. I, my forecast when the Flex Act came was that there'd be this rush again, like the first wave, um, because there's 130 billion left. Um, but we haven't yet seen that. We haven't seen the level of activity that uh, we thought we might. I, like I said, there is some dialogue to move the June 30th date further out. Um, we're getting into the summer. Some businesses are going to reopen. I think they're going to struggle when they do. Um, you know, restaurants, gyms, uh, Main Street USA, uh, barbers, hairstylists. I think there'll be a little bit of hyper demand, but they may struggle and they may need the loan at that point. So if they do extend it, maybe the program gets fully subscribed, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but those two things were definitely, I think, you know, from the folks I've been talking to, the certification issue was a challenge across, you know, all the way from the smallest to the small to the largest to the large. Um, there were some other industry issues. Um, I know not relevant to you guys, but in the financial advisor community, um, a few decided to take it and then gave the money back because there were some disclosures that they had to make to their client base. So if you're taking somebody's money to invest it, the last thing you want to suggest is that you had to take a loan to cover your payroll. Um, so I dealt with a few financial advisors that decided to give it back because they didn't want to make that disclosure. So it's been a moving target. Uh, and I think a lot of people kind of got turned off by that. Do you think it's fair to assume that um, we may not see another wave of new applications until they actually do post all the FAQs? Because, you know, it's great. We heard the act passed on Friday. Um, we've heard the treasury statements. But if you actually go to the SBA website with the Paycheck Protection Program details, um, it's still outdated, so nothing has been updated yet. So do you think it's fair, you know, do you think people are okay to start the application process now, or do you think they should really wait until, you know, you know, from their perspective, things are final? I think the law is there. I think the theme is that the goalposts keep getting closer. Um, that there was a there was a fundamental change in the way the Treasury start, was regulating this program from the moment they changed the certification forward. They've regulated it in a very uh, more friendly manner, as if they're going to be reelected. Uh, I think what happened is you saw the legislature really insert themselves at a detail level. And those folks are, you know, in with the local communities. They're voted in by the local communities. So they got the feedback and took it to the regulators. And I think really, um, you know, pressed down on them and, and for good. I mean, I think the program is closer to what the legislative intent was than when we started. And I think we're going to continue to see more and more relief. I think it's critical for the U.S. economy. Um, I think it's critical for the sustainability of the, the jobs and for the recoverability of, of the economy. Um, I don't think any of us knows when the U.S. goes back to normal. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not somebody that's a very anxious person. But we're in our fourth month now, and I'm very comfortable. And um, luckily, I can work from wherever I am, wherever that may be. And I'm fortunate and thankful for that. 
but there's this, you know, anxiety that I wake up with looking for normalcy. Um, and we're not sure if in December it will be that way or September. Uh, I have this sense, and maybe it's my summer madness, is, you know, when Labor Day comes, everything will look normal again. But uh, we'll see. But the one thing, uh, I'm going off on a tangent. I think the U.S. government will continue to support the small businesses and the sustainability of those businesses if this goes on longer. We're hopeful that it won't. And I think we have enough incentive and stimulus based on what we think today. But should some, should something change, I uh, it seems like it's a bottomless well, which it isn't. Uh, but I think the government will continue to support small business in this fashion. Great, that's definitely reassuring. Um, Jeff, do you have any final comments for the group today? Well, I, I think we've shared obviously a lot of critical information um, and again, uh, stressed the importance of uh, what's changed in the Flexibility Act. I think, uh, you know, some of our thoughts is dealing with hundreds of clients and people managing these processes over the last few months is there's, everyone has a different scenario. Um, you know, it's important as we shared to make sure you look at your circumstances to maximize uh, the usage of the loan, and then obviously make sure it can be handled under forgiveness. Uh, to definitely stay on top and in touch with advisors like us and others. Um, there's going to be more, you know, adjustments, even though we think the bulk of what we see here is what's going to be final. Um, Lou has mentioned before about the FAQs, uh, and there's still a couple unanswered questions as we get into this uh, forgiveness process uh, over the summer, and then obviously later in the year. Um, so just to stay on top, and obviously we hope to work with you know many of the Henry Schein customers and continue to be aligned with obviously the great organization that you have in being uh, an information source to make sure people are aware of all the updates, changes that, that come to play on this. Um, but just, again, stay in touch, stay involved. Uh, definitely start using the money if you haven't, um, even though you have the 24 weeks, hopefully in some of the harder hit areas, you know, the businesses are beginning to open. We see here in the New York area where Lou and I are that dental practices now are finally reopening. Uh, phase two kind of comes uh, to pass in, in most of the major areas in New York. So we're excited that uh, business will be back and these loans can be used and people can be reemployed. One of the areas we didn't touch upon in this session that we, we did in the earlier one is there has also been a struggle with people bringing employees back in some cases. Uh, kind of the infamous uh, pandemic unemployment assistance, the quote-unquote extra $600 a week that folks that were on furlough or that were terminated uh, were receiving. Just to remind all the business owners, if you are reopening and you're asking your employees to come back off a of furlough or you would like to rehire them off of their terminated status, if they refuse to return, not only as Lou shared before, will they not necessarily be deleted as a headcount for PPP loan? Um, they also are not eligible for unemployment. And while you want to be fair to employees and you're not looking to put them in harm's way, if you need them back and they refuse to and saying, I want to have unemployment, I'm comfortable, um, you have a right to contest unemployment, and we would recommend that you do that. One is an incentive to make sure people come back. And two, you know, again, the government has put a lot of money into unemployment, a lot of money into this PPP loan program. The unemployment assistance was not created just as a, as a, as a gift to have people not work and, and get paid. If people have uh, issues where they need to take time off or leave or involve, you know, have contracted the virus, that's what the Family First Coronavirus Response Assistance Act is for. Um, and that is still out there through the end of December. And again, we've advised many clients on the application of uh, that law as well and still, again, in play and uh, but that's people, again, who qualify for the emergency FMLA, that they're a caretaker of, you know, a child or a family member, and they can get up to, you know, 12 weeks of, of uh, paid leave, and then the emergency sick leave, someone who's contracted uh, the virus or has had significant exposure and has uh, a doctor's note about that exposure gets two weeks of, of pay. So those are elements, again, to look into kind of created as a part of the PPP loan program, but also the surrounding effects of it as well. And Lou, you have some additional thoughts? 
just uh, you know, evaluate all the stimulus out there. A lot of the state and local governments also have done some things much smaller scale than PPP. I know, you know, my local economy, Nassau County, has done something uh, for folks that either couldn't take advantage of the PPP or for for some other reasons. And I know New York City has done some stuff. It's usually for the very of the the very small of the smallest, um, but worth a look. Uh, usually, the local IDA is a uh, a good uh, resource for that. Um, so take a look at that. And the one other thing I didn't mention that the Flex Act changed um, was the payroll tax deferral. Uh, so the CARES Act allowed you to um, the take the employer portion of the Social Security tax, which is a payroll tax, and it allowed you to hold on paying that. So you didn't have to pay it. You can hold the money, and then you would be required to repay it in December of 2021 and 2022. So very cheap cost of financing. It's a zero interest loan, essentially. It's not the first place you want to borrow from, um, but if you need some assistance with cash flow, it is available. The Flex Act um, allowed that program to operate with PPP. So if you're a PPP recipient, um, prior to the Flex Act, you could use it, but when the loan got forgiven, you would then have to remit it. Now you use it just like any other user. Uh, if you have PPP or not, you can utilize that deferral and then not have to remit that money to the to the, lo the local payroll taxes until December. Uh, sorry, the federal payroll taxes until December and um, December of 2021 and 2022. So that's a you know it's six and a half percent approximately of of the payroll. So it's not a big amount, but uh, it's another source of potential uh, cash flow assistance. That's great. Well, um, on that note, I would like to thank both of you for your time and valuable insights on this topic. Um, I think uh, for our customers, that final FAQ, um, that's going to be really important for us to really determine what else might be behind the Flex Act that we aren't fully aware of. Um, so we'll be looking to provide a brief update to our customers once that happens. Um, we do keep the Henry Schein CARES Act site up to date with information as it becomes available to us. So we are obviously watching this very closely. So on that note, I'd just like to thank everybody for their time today and thanks for tuning in. And we we'll look forward to providing you with continuous updates on this topic.